In this unit, entitled Energy and Reactions, we'll get our first small taste of thermodynamics. There will be much more coming in thermodynamics in College Chem 2. Perhaps we should have called this thermochemistry. We will cover the first law of thermodynamics, enthalpy, heats of reaction, Hess's law, often called Hess's law of constant heat summation, heat capacity, and calorimetry. There are some terms that we need to be sure we're on the same page with. The first of which is energy. Energy is defined as the ability to do work. Well, sometimes students have a hard time getting a handle on this. So let's look at it this way. There are two kinds of energy. There is kinetic energy, which is energy in motion, if you will. Energy being absorbed, energy being produced. There is also potential energy. That is energy of position. You might also think of it as stored energy. Now, there are numerous forms of energy, such as electrical energy, mechanical energy, chemical energy, just to name a few. Let's look at the law of conservation of energy. Actually, this is the first law of thermodynamics, and it states that the quantity of energy in the universe is constant. Or it might be stated that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but it can be changed from one form to another. And no, we are not talking about nuclear reactions at this point. We're talking about chemical kinds of changes and physical kinds of changes. Let's consider the Earth and its energy requirements for a moment. The Earth must absorb and release approximately equivalent amounts of energy, or its average temperature is going to change. Well, what is the source of this energy? Well, the sun, of course. That's the main source of its energy. How much energy do we get from the sun? We get approximately 1.7 times 10 to the 17th joules per second. 1.7 times 10 to the 17th joules per second. Predominantly as visible and ultraviolet radiation. Now nearly a third of that is reflected back, back into space, by the clouds, by, by water, by the atmosphere. The remainder, however, impacts the Earth, but eventually now is going to have to radiate back into space in some form. Nearly half of the energy then that we absorbed is converted from light to heat, which warms the Earth and warms its atmosphere. The cycle continues as the Earth and atmosphere radiate that energy back in the form of heat. A significant amount of this energy is absorbed by moisture, and as the energy is absorbed by moisture, clouds are formed. And the clouds form, continuing to absorb this moisture, and then they release this moisture in the form of precipitation, rain, snow, sleep, things like that. But when it is released, the energy is given off and it radiates out. A portion of the energy is absorbed by the earth, for example, by plant life, allowing plants to form carbohydrates, to form coal and things like that. And then when these things are burned, carbohydrates, for example, by plant, by animal life and so forth, that produces energy. When the coal is burned, that produces energy. And all of this radiates back out. Energy is released as heat when substances are consumed. Energy is absorbed. And as energy is absorbed, things change. But the heat gained and the heat lost must be approximately equivalent. Folks, this is a huge example of the first law of thermodynamics. 
there are some more important terms we need to discuss. First is the concept of system. A system is what we are talking about. It's, it's what we're measuring. It may be the, the contents of the beaker that happen to be reacting. That is called our system. The surroundings is everything else. It can be the beaker itself. It can be the other parts of the immediate environment. It can be the, the area in which the system is sitting and it extends ever outward. And then there is the universe. The universe is the system plus the surroundings. There are several types of systems. There's the open system. And in the open system, an exchange of matter and energy with the surroundings can occur. For example, you might have a cup of hot coffee and the coffee is giving off steam. That is an exchange of matter. And the coffee is also getting cooler as it's giving off heat to the surroundings. That is an exchange of energy. Of course, you could also have a cup of cold coffee and, and put it in a warm place and it would gain a little bit of heat, wouldn't it? So that is a case then still of an open system. Then there's the closed system. Now in a closed system, you can have an exchange of energy, but not matter with the surroundings. For example, perhaps you're thinking of a, of a hot plate and the hot plate is giving off energy to the surroundings, but it is not giving off any matter with the surroundings. If it is, you better get your hot plate checked. Then there is the isolated system. And in the isolated system, theoretically, nothing can be exchanged. That is the concept of a thermos, that the thermos does not allow any of the material within it to escape, nor does it absorb material from those surroundings, and it does not allow any of the heat or energy to escape, nor does it absorb any from the surroundings. Let's talk about internal energy. We represent internal energy by the term E, and it is the sum of the kinetic and potential energies of the individual particles that we're addressing. The potential energy, remember, is thought of as stored energy, and the kinetic energy is energy in motion or energy of motion. Let's talk about that motion a little bit. To the chemist, the motion is motion of molecules. Let me show you what I mean. You can have translational motion. Now, translational motion is straight line motion. As the molecule literally bounces around. We can have rotational motion, which is rotation about a point like this. But there's another form of rotational motion that is actually a tumble, more along the lines of this. And there is vibrational motion, which involves stretching and contracting. Usually, we think about the bonds, something like this. Imagine all of that going on at the same time, and you begin to get a picture of what a dynamic entity a molecule is. We were talking about internal energy. We said it was represented by the term E and is the sum of the kinetic and potential energies of the individual particles. And from there, we started talking about motion of molecules. But let's continue with our thoughts now. According to the law of conservation of energy, the quantity of energy in the universe is constant. Therefore, any change in energy of the system plus the change in energy of the surroundings has to be equal to zero. You can't gain or lose energy overall. It has to be interchanged. In other words, you have a change in energy of the system that's going to go to the change change in energy of the surroundings, which will come back to the system. It's a cyclical situation. But what is delta E? Well, delta E is the final energy minus the initial energy. That is the way we... Heat 
may be transferred. How can heat be transferred? Well, it can be transferred by flowing from a hotter body to a cooler body. And that is temperature-wise, folks. That's not energy content-wise. That is temperature-wise. It can also be transferred by work by a force acting through a distance. Let's see how that happens. The change in energy of a system is equal to Q plus W. Q plus W, where Q is the heat flowing into or out of the system. Get that now. Q is heat, the heat that is flowing either into the system or out of the system. And W is the work done on or by the system. So the change in energy of a system is going to be the heat factor plus the work factor. Now, students sometimes start really saying, oh, I, I can't get this. Yes, you can. Let me give you an analogy. I want you to think of delta E as the changes in an energy account. This is an analogy that was used by professors Riddell and Navidi of the City University of New York, and I thought it was just a wonderful way of presenting it. You have an energy account, and the energy in the account increases when heat flows into the account, or when work is done on the account. In other words, the account is the system. And the value, the energy value of the account may change. It changes when heat flows into it, it increases. Or when work is done on it, it increases. It decreases if heat flows out of it. Or if that account has to do work on the surroundings. Yeah. Now let's look at changes in internal energy. Plus Q. If, plus Q, if, have, if we have a positive Q, we have gained heat. The system has absorbed heat. If it's a reaction, the reaction's absorbing heat. It's endothermic, sure. For example, here we have a situation in which we have the system here and we're heating it up. That's right. The reaction that is going on, if there is a reaction, or that system right there, is endothermic. It is absorbing heat, in this case, from the hot plate. So if positive Q means it's absorbing heat, the negative Q must mean the system is giving up heat. Well, if it's giving up heat and is a reaction, then the reaction is exothermic. And so you see the the hot plate right there turning very hot and giving off all this heat. Yeah. And if the hot plate is the system, it is really giving off heat. Plus W means the surroundings work on the system. The system is gaining energy from the surroundings. The work is positive. It is a gaining factor. For example, when the pressure increases, on that gas, and the gas is your system. When the pressure increases, work is done on the system by the surroundings. And that gas, that system, has an increase in energy. On the other hand, a minus W means the system works on the surroundings. In this case, it pushes back. So when the pressure decreases, Work is done on the surroundings by the system. Yeah. Do you get the idea? Consider a gas that's being heated by a Bunsen burner. Here we have a small expandable volume up there that is going to be heated. So we heat it, and what happens? That's right. If the gas absorbs... The gas in that expandable container absorbs 500 kilojoules of heat from the Bunsen burner. And as it expands, it does 800 kilojoules of work against the surroundings. Then Q is a plus 500 kilojoules. And W is a negative 800 kilojoules. 
And since delta E is equal to Q plus W, then delta E is equal to plus 500 kilojoules minus 800 kilojoules. So the change in energy is minus 300 kilojoules. In other words, the system gave off 300 kilojoules of energy. That was the change in the internal energy of the system. The gas lost energy to the surroundings as it pushed the surroundings back. And it lost more energy than it gained from heat in this situation. Therefore, the change in energy is less than Q. That's right, in this case. Now let's look at work. Work is equal to negative P delta V at constant pressure. We're only going to be dealing with constant pressure. Work is negative if the volume increases. Imagine putting a positive value in there for delta V. You multiply that by a negative P and you've got negative work. Why does that happen? Why is work negative if the volume increases? It is negative because if the volume increases, the volume is the system, it is pushing against the surroundings. Therefore, work is being given off, and that is energy that is being utilized, that is being expended on the surroundings. On the other hand, work is positive if the volume decreases. Why is that? Because if the volume, that's the system, decreases, it's because the surroundings are pushing on the volume. They're pushing on the volume. So work is being done on the system. So work is positive. The change in volume, remember this, the change in volume is the final volume minus the initial volume. Folks, that's the way we define change in something. Change in temperature is final temperature minus initial temperature. Change in volume is final volume minus initial volume. Change in ener energy is final energy minus initial energy. Remember, the system is at a constant pressure, and it's only the volume that is changing in this situation. Let's look a little more at this work equals negative P delta V at constant pressure. Folks, you need to understand, the pressure did not change when the balloon expanded. That's the pressure in the system. That's the pressure of, of that gas or whatever that was in that system that was expanding. The pressure was constant. The heat was transferred at a constant pressure, or the energy, if you will, was transferred at a constant pressure. So QP is the heat at constant pressure. And QP is the version that we're going to be working with almost exclusively. Could we have a QV? Oh, yes. We could have a QV, but no work could be done because work cannot be done against the surroundings if the volume is constant. The gas would not be expanding. But QV describes a bomb calorimeter. Professor Bertrand has allowed me to use this excellent drawing that he has here, this, this clip art. Here you have a, a bomb calorimeter. The whole thing is enclosed in this case. It is held at constant volume. So when the reaction occurs, and everything inside heats up, the temperature will change, but the volume cannot change. So that's an example of a QV. But like I say, we're not really going to worry about this. Let's look at this reaction. In this reaction, we have calcium carbonate, which is a solid, when heated, giving us calcium oxide and carbon dioxide gas. Now look. We went from a solid to a solid plus a gas. 
And because this reaction produces more gas than it consumes, it can push the surroundings back. So when we do this reaction, this reaction has the potential to do work, to push the surroundings back. Now, look at this one. We have phosphorus trichloride, which is a solid, plus chlorine gas, producing PCL5, which is a solid. We went from a gas and a solid to just a solid. So what do you think happened to our situation here? Well, because the reaction does not produce more gas than it consumes, it can't do pressure delta V work. Why? Because there is what? There is a reduction in the volume. That's right. There is a reduction in the volume. So the surroundings are working on the system. So there can be no P delta V work here. Not P delta V work by the system, that is. Look at this reaction. We have two moles of hydrogen gas plus a mole of oxygen gas producing two moles of, of water in the gaseous form. We have three moles of gas on the left for every two moles of gas on the right. Now folks, can this reaction do work against the surroundings? Can it? Is it expanding against the surroundings? And the answer is no. The surroundings are working on the system. So can the reaction do work against the surroundings? The answer is no. What about this one? Here we have hydrogen gas plus chlorine gas producing two HCl gas. We have two moles of reactants for every two moles of products, all gases. So what about this one? The answer is the number of moles of gas produced equals the number of moles of gas consumed. So is work done? No. No work is done. No work is done by the system. No work is done by the surroundings. Now let's have a look at state functions. These are just a number of terms that we've got to get settled. State functions are properties that describe the state of a system. Properties that describe the state of a system. What are some examples? Well, pressure, temperature, volume, quantity of material. That, that's just a few. There are others. And we'll deal with some more in time. But what you need to know is that state functions are properties whose change is dependent on and only on the initial and final states of the system. For example, we could have a change in volume. That then tells us that volume is a state function because the change in volume is described as the final volume minus the initial volume. Pressure. The change in pressure is the final pressure minus the initial pressure. Got the idea? So, state functions then are properties. They're properties that describe the state of a system, and they depend on and only on the initial and final states of the system. State functions now are the changes that things that change, and the change may be described very simply as the difference between the initial and the final values, and that is completely without regard for how the change occurred. In other words, the path that was taken. Let me give you an analogy. You're hiking in the woods, and you hear a ferocious growl, and all of a sudden you're in a tree. Now, it doesn't matter how you got in the tree. The fact is, you were hiking and there's a bear. The states of this thing is you're in the tree minus you're on the ground. It doesn't matter whether you got there by running up it, whether you took one mighty leap, 
whether a helicopter came along and snagged you and lifted you up there, the fact is you are up in the tree. The changes are just the difference between the initial and final values without regard for how the change occurred. Now, folks, there are some other things, though, that are to be considered that are not state functions. For example, work and heat. Work and heat are path dependent. And you can have a final minus an initial on those, but that doesn't totally describe it because they are path dependent. It's back to state functions. State functions have another name. They are also called thermodynamic properties. Thermodynamic properties. Final minus initial. Now let's look at enthalpy. Enthalpy? Enthalpy is a term that you're going to hear off and on in your chemistry career. You'll hear a lot more about enthalpy later on and when you get to the second half of this this course if you if you go there when you're in college chemistry too. But enthalpy is a state function. Specifically, enthalpy, which we use an H to represent, is the sum of the internal energy of a system and its pressure, volume, work product. Ugh. Enthalpy. It is the sum of the internal energy plus the pressure, volume, work product. In other words, H, which is enthalpy, is equal to E plus PV, the internal energy and the pressure, volume, work product. But remember, it's a state function. And as a state function, it depends only on the state of the system at that point in time, regardless of how the state was achieved. Remember, it depends only on the state of the system at that point in time without, without considering how you got to the state. It's only the difference, the difference in the fact that you're in the tree as compared to being on the ground, regardless of how you got there. Properties of enthalpy, by the way, that can also be pronounced enthalpy. A change in enthalpy, delta H, delta H, may then be written as the final enthalpy minus the initial enthalpy, right? Final minus initial, which is more commonly expressed as the enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants. Folks, if we're talking about a reaction that is occurring, then the final state minus the initial state is described as the products minus the reactants, right? The change in enthalpy of the products minus the change in enthalpy of the reactants. What we wound up with minus what we started out with. But remember, a moment ago we said that enthalpy is equal to energy plus the pressure volume relationship, pressure volume factor. Therefore, a change in enthalpy is equal to a change in the internal energy plus a change in the pressure volume factor. Well, let's look at this from the view of a constant pressure system. And instead of having delta H is equal to delta E plus delta PV, we're going to hold pressure constant and just allow volume to change because we're going to be working in a constant pressure system. So we have delta H is equal to delta E plus P delta V. Delta H is equal to delta E plus P delta V. Now, pay recall that delta E is equal to Q plus W. 
Well, if delta E is equal to Q plus W, and you also know that W is equal to minus P delta V, then delta E is equal to Q minus P delta V. Got that? That simple derivation. I just substituted minus P delta V for W in that equation. Recall also that delta H is equal to delta E plus P delta V, so therefore we're going to have delta H is equal to Q minus P delta V, that's delta E, folks, plus P delta V. Well, using your good algebra, you will see that delta H is equal to Q. But remember, that is for and only for a constant pressure system. Let's look at enthalpy of formation. And we're talking about formation of bonds. Folks, energy is emitted when bonds form. We're not going to get into any circumstances in which that might not be the case. We're only going to deal with energy is emitted when bonds are formed. The energy emitted when one mole of a substance is formed from its elements in their most stable form at standard state conditions is called the energy of formation. That was a mouthful. Let's go back through that again slowly. The energy emitted when a mole of a substance is formed is called the energy of formation. But the mole of the substance must be formed from the elements at standard state condition. And it can't be the elements in just any form. It must be the elements in their most stable forms at standard state conditions. Now let's go through it again. The energy emitted when one mole of a substance is formed from its elements in their most stable forms at standard state conditions is called the energy of formation. And it is represented by delta H super zero sub F. The super zero means we're talking about standard state conditions. Now, I didn't say standard conditions. It's standard state conditions. And the sub F means it is specifically, it is the heat of formation. Get those notations down. We're going to elaborate on those. Standard state conditions and heat of formation. I think what we need to do is look at an example. So I'm going to give you the equation for the formation of calcium oxide. And here it is. It's calcium solid plus half an oxygen molecule gas giving us calcium oxide solid. Now, you might ask, why did we use a half O2? Why didn't we just use O? Well, the reason is the most stable state of oxygen at standard state conditions is O2. O may exist at standard state conditions, but it's not the most stable state. Therefore, we choose to write it like this, in keeping with what we agreed was going to be our consistent way of doing this. Now, the delta H sub F for the formation of calcium oxide is minus 635.1 kilojoules per mole. Now look, folks, you're going to have to keep close track of those units or you'll really get messed up. Where did this come from? Well, I, I don't remember the delta H sub Fs for a lot of these things, for most of them. I just remember a few things. So where did it come from? It came from a table of thermodynamic data. If you look in the appendix of a textbook or a CRC handbook of chemistry and physics or some other sort of reference like that or the note guide accompanying these lectures, you will find tables of thermodynamic information. Well, what are standard state conditions? Technically, pressure, it's one bar pressure. But one bar pressure is so close to one atmosphere that, quite frankly, most of the times you hear it said, oh, it's one atmosphere of pressure. 
25 degrees Celsius, and if it's a solution, the concentration is one mole per liter, or if it's a solid, it's a pure solid, or if it's a liquid, it's a pure liquid. Got it? These are standard state conditions. Most of the sources that you're going to probably see, and most of the problems that you'll probably see, are going to have it issued as 25 degrees Celsius in one atmosphere of pressure. Understand that technically it is one bar of pressure, but that is so close to one atmosphere that we will use them interchangeably. But do please remember that the concentration is mole, as in moles per liter, and it's one mole per liter, and it's a pure solid if you're dealing with a solid or a pure liquid if you're dealing with a liquid. Now we're ready to talk about heats of reaction, but let's do that in the second lecture. A better way to teach and learn chemistry.